Thanks, Moko. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you uh, scheduling this call this way because I'm out of the office. The hurricane just blew me out of the state. <laughs> I barely escaped with my life. I don't know if you guys care. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> Somewhat. Nah, it wasn't. It wasn't that bad on the in, on the inside. It was kind of bad on the coastline. But thanks for joining everybody. Today is uh, what October the tenth. October tenth, and uh, Moko is hosting the call. And I'm not in my office, so I wanted to talk about some things as I as I posted on Ace of Coins, uh, and that has to do with, I guess, more of it's an overview about how people are being liquidated. And so, you know, I always talk about my material has to do with property rights, most of which you guys come to me because you want to deal with cryptos or investing or taxes or administrative problems like with the IRS or something like that. But we get into so many other uh, aspects of where there is financial risk. And, you know, that's a large part of what I do. But also, I don't mention too much, but like, as you just probably heard at the beginning of this call, we're talking about a liquidated damages clause in a contract where the parties are very sophisticated. And you don't hear me talking too much about that situation because it's unusual, but my suggestion there, and we can get into that if you want to, but you don't just have a liquidated damages clause. You have something that rewards the people that have the ability and have a history of easily getting an attorney to do something for them, right? Take it to court and that sort of thing. Because sometimes you're dealing with people that are more sophisticated and whether or not you have a right over something may be irrelevant if the other person is more sophisticated than you or is more connected and you know has more experience knowing understanding what he can do and get away with i've had situations where i'm working with a client like for example uh there's this one uh, contractor that built houses for um uh homeowners that were building homes that were worth over five million dollars this is a few years ago and they, these people that are, you know, are rich, they understand how they use the legal system. They use it like money. So what they'll do is, in his case, his problem was he was writing the contract. It was a standard contract that you would use for anybody. I mean, he shouldn't have been doing that. What was happening is the rich people, because they know everybody and they know what to do, they were using the court system to coerce him and intimidate him into lowering the price that he, they had already agreed on. So I showed him how to get out of that because you got to you got to consider the risk by the parties you're being also being involved with. So I don't talk too much about that, but it just came up today. Uh, but what I want to talk about was the language I like to use is how people are being liquidated. Okay. So you're going to see a lot of this. I try to break it into subjects. So the most popular one I've been dealing with since the early nineties was unsecured debt collections and unsecured debt collections, including uh, student loans and state and federal income taxes. Uh, and then mm -hmm. we get into these other things where, um, well, all that stuff involves administrative law and, 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 and the rules of civil procedure and this sort of thing. But then we get into um, now the land grab that's going on. And I want to address how, how uh, people are being liquidated. So I'm going over these categories. So the videos that I produce are at aceofcoins.club. And then people can get consultations with me through aceofcoins.com. I know I always, I always forget to mention that, but some of the, some people are new. So I, I always want to try to remember to do that. But um we we have a uh, family court, okay? And as you are aware, I think family court for most states, the rules of procedure were revised about 30 years ago for most states. And um, most of us aren't familiar with this and your attorney's not gonna tell you this because the attorney's in, in part of it. And I'll explain how that works. But the rules of family court are purely about a liquidation. A liquidation is where your property and your property rights are, are exchanged for dollars and then distributed without your consent. That's what a liquidation is. And that's what people go through when they file a bankruptcy. You, you can conduct a bankruptcy outside of the United States. You don't have to file a bankruptcy in a chapter 13, for example, like everyone's familiar with. You can actually conduct a receivership or bankruptcy proceeding in your state court. There's, there's <clears throat> statutes for this. But what's happened is the family court rules of procedure, for example, have include, include provisions for the discovery of assets and the reallocation of assets. Now, it's not like the authority is given there. I'm just saying it's being used for that when it, it actually there is no authority for reallocating mm. or liquidating your property. OK, mm -hmm. this is what's happening. So this is one way where people are being liquidated. This is how I like to describe it. So in family court, what's what's happening is the judge is acting as the receiver in an involuntary receivership and typically the defendant 
and or the marital community, which is never identified in the proceeding, is being liquidated. So all the property rights, including child custody, child custody is a property right. All that's being mowed over, okay, bulldozed over by the court without the court considering how those rights are already being exercised for the benefit of the people involved. And that's what the court is supposed to be doing. So what, what happens when, let me give, give you a small micro example. When a court orders someone to sell his property, well, first of all, the fact that he has the judge has to order someone to sell his house means that he doesn't have the authority to sell the house, right? So the person who's being ordered to do this can just say, no. Mm -hmm. But then the judge threatens him with contempt. Well, that right. demonstrates further how the court has no authority. Yeah, you mm -hmm. can put me in jail, you can shoot me, but you still don't have the authority to sell my house. <laughs> no, I don't have the I don't have the obligation to enter into a contract. No, moreover, the other proof, the evidence that shows that you don't have the authority as judge to sell my house is that you can't require someone to buy it, nor can you require someone to lend me money against the equity. So that just shows you that the judge has no authority, but he's just coercing people into doing that. So that's a liquidation, taking your property above and beyond your consent, your authority. And when where the authority comes from is people should understand in a, in a family court proceeding, the authority when you're a parent and when you're a husband and when you're a mother and when you're a wife, the authority comes from your responsibility to the people in your family. Mm -hmm. The court doesn't have it. So therefore, the court has no authority mm -hmm. unless there's abuse or neglect. And that starts with there being allegations of abuse or neglect. So without getting too far into that, I'm just saying that's a general overview of one aspect of our society that's being used to liquidate people. So if you're going to do that, right? So let's say this, like in, as in many cases, in a divorce proceeding, the, the house is sold. Well, what happens with the financing on that? Who's making all the money on the financing? Well, when you sell your house, what happens to the debt? It gets refinanced, doesn't it? The loan gets paid off. So if your interest rate, well, let's say let's say it's 6%, right? And let's say you've been paying it for 10 years. And then you sell your house, but you wouldn't have sold your house otherwise. And you sell your house after the 10-year mark with a note that's 6%. Do you think the bank's making 6%? No, it's making like 42%. Mm -hmm. This is a wealth transfer. Family court is a wealth transfer. That's just one little teeny tiny example of what's happening in, in family court. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how is this being conducted? Well, people go for lawyers, right? And if you don't, they penalize you in some way. But the lawyer is not practicing law and he's not your advocate. You don't have an advocate. You're on your own, okay? You're, you're swimming in the shipping channel, okay? Uh, the lawyer is practicing attornment. Attornment is the taking of property. In a system of fealty, basically, to, to summarize it. It's a, crude, it's a crude definition, but I'm just going to summarize it. So your attorney is there to take property, your property, convert your property and your property rights into the custody of the court and let the court decide what to do with it without consideration as to how your property was being used to benefit others. That's just one little microcosm. That's this family court. Hey there, Ray. Then we get into other things like, you know, you got the IRS, you got the state tax creatures. And then you got your administrative agencies, and now we've got the counties taking land, especially in California. You've got other places too. Uh, Ray knows a lot of other places. There's Georgia, and you know they're they're taking land for for different reasons. Like, in, I mean, we can we can give you a list of like let's say probably a half dozen reasons why people's land is being taken, and the way it's being taken is through the application of property taxes and fines and penalties, uh, and also like for example, uh, just fabricating. Penalties and fines really is what's going on. Okay, that's going on in California. Mm -hmm. What's what they're what the governments are trying to do, and they're acting in unison. There's financial interest behind all the counties, so the counties are following some foreign financial interest, but they are using their claims on the title to take the property. Property taxes being one, right? So you're gonna see the taxes go up because of this, and then you see where their BlackRock owns most of everything. In fact, you're paying for BlackRock. You have no choice. Every time you do something in the economy, uh, BlackRock is getting a piece of the action. So that's like a hidden tax, okay? So here are the most common things that people understand. You're being liquidated when you file a bankruptcy. So people kind of accept that. I'm not going to get into why you shouldn't, but let's just say bankruptcy is a form of liquidation overtly. They're saying that's what it is. That, that's where you repay the creditors. Family court also form of liquidation and there are no debtors it's it's illegal but they're doing it 
the, the, it's the trial court judges. It's not the it's not the IRS is your problem. It's the trial court judges. That's a form of liquidation. Now you've also got a situation where you're a wage earner. You've sold your your sold your labor at a discount. Okay, that's what's happening. It's your your corporation is acquiring your labor at a discount, at a discount rate, and you're a liability. That's really what you are. You're not an employee. You're a liability. Is, is that's how the system works. And to to further uh, uh, tie you down, okay, you're being offered the benefits of tax deferment with an IRA of some sort, a 401k or IRA or something like that, right? And so your thinking is, wow, it's a great idea not to pay taxes on some of this money, and then maybe I'll get the benefit 30 years from now, <laughs> right? It's kind of silly because in that 30-year period or 20-year period, you're missing opportunity that you could have by using your own cash or capital to invest in something. And you don't always use your own capital, but it's a good start. It's a good start for many of us to invest our own money in something, right? So that's being taken away by deception. Why are you concerned about not paying more taxes when it's better to pay the tax and take what cash you have left over and go and invest something? Then the tax doesn't matter to you anymore, right? So these pension funds, IRAs, 401ks, that's just a scheme to further liquidate you by by taking or tricking you into into agreeing to give up opportunity to use your own cash right and and other things i mean so so this is a, a most of what i i get into is where people are being liquidated same thing in like a um i'll give an example uh so debt collection so let's say you have eight creditors you can't pay them it's lots of debt let's say it comes out to like you know sixty five thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars and you have a, a half dozen creditors okay and then two or three of them sue you. And so you go to a lawyer and the lawyer is going to get you into a payment plan of some kind, mm -hmm. whether you call it a bankruptcy or a settlement or a consolidation, that's nothing but a payment plan. All those are. And all those payment plans create tax liabilities. That's what the attorney is going to do to you, right? He's not going to talk about the Consumer Credit Protection Act, which says, if you just don't do anything, the first creditor that sues you and gets a wage garnishment, he'll be able to garnish your wages for a limited, limited amount of money, like in New York, 10%, okay, of your take-home pay, or in California, 25% of your take-home pay. That's not a bad deal because it'll block all your other creditors. So you'll only be paying one creditor at a time. Whereas if you go into a settlement or bankruptcy, you're going to pay them all at once. And then people always ask me, what about a Chapter 7? And I say, well, if you qualify for a Chapter 7, that just tells you that you shouldn't be filing bankruptcy at all because you're insolvent and you're uncollectible. That's the whole idea. People don't know when they're uncollectible. They don't understand where the risk is. The risk is not in getting a bunch of annoying phone calls saying you owe money. Yeah, that's stressful. That's not the taking of your property. What you want to do is focus on not allowing someone to take your property by using different asset protection strategies. I have mm -hmm. several, other people have several, but you wanna focus on that instead of trying to come up with a payment plan. The reason being, I'll give you a great example. I talked to a gentleman a few years ago and he called me about four months ago to thank me. He said a few years ago, I told him on a, on a conference call, not a, on, a, on a consultation call, I, he asked me what to do with this cash he had and he had a list of creditors and he said he could pay them off. And I said, well, let them scream for the money and go put your cash into something that's going to make money, which he did. He figured that out. I don't know what it was. And he said, I did what you said. I took out whatever it was, like 50000 He had like 50000 I'm not saying you need $50,000 to do this, but he did not pay the creditors. They probably sued him or whatever. In fact, I don't even know because he didn't tell me because he doesn't care because he was uncollectible. And he took his money and he, he invested it to a point where he was able to quit his job and live off what his investment was. And still make money. He was still making more money without even needing a job. And I'm not saying that's the, the situation for everybody, but that's what you want to do is if you're going to pay off an old liability and it's not going to give you anything right now, more than what it already gave you, then don't do it. Rethink that uh, that plan and consider putting it somewhere else. And the friendliest creditor, anybody want to take a, a guess at this one? Who's the friendliest creditor in the entire country? <laughs> the IRS. It's the IRS. <laughs> so for many of you that owe the IRS, don't be afraid of the IRS. Just don't lie to them. File correct tax returns if you're filing returns. Um, but if you owe the IRS, good for you. When you start using your money properly, you'll wish you owed them more. Because if, for those of you who can't figure out that they can find financing somewhere, just get into debt with the government. <laughs> They're the friendliest creditor. If you owe the government money, don't pay the government. Use it to go buy assets. Then if you have a return on those assets, maybe you can work out a plan that makes sense that you're not going to miss that money at all.
So anyways, watch what you're seeing. There's a liquidation going on in almost every aspect of our economy. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's just like, and I'll, I heard this on the radio. Okay. And I know this is true. I could probably do more research for it, but just to give you like a direction into doing some research. So there are people that work for large corporations that are on the stock exchanges. Like I'm just, I always use IBM as an example. So IBM is a publicly traded company and people work for IBM and some of the people, you know, are higher up, let's say, and they are, they're shareholders. And so they're, they're paying attention. They know what IBM's doing. They're policymakers at IBM. So they know what they're doing. And they, they know what's going to happen with IBM in three months and three years and this sort of thing. That makes them an insider, but it's legal. They're not deliberately being an insider, you know, and doing insider trading, so to speak, but that's going on. It can never be proven and it's quasi legal. Let's put, let's put it that way. Well, these people that are understanding where to put their money when it concerns their stock investments with the company they work for, 80% of them right now are selling. There's more and more insider selling than, than you can imagine, okay? Let's say 80%. It's probably more. The insiders in these big publicly traded companies are selling. And who's buying? It's the consumer who doesn't understand. He's not looking at trends. He doesn't understand the stuff. Or those who are maybe looking at trends and they think they understand what they're doing. So you're gambling, really. So, so we must be pops possibly at a high point if the insiders are selling. How do you get that information? I don't know. You probably have to look at some charts and I wouldn't know it's outside of my knowledge base. I'm just saying you're, 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 you're kind of on your own here. Okay. So realize a lot of, there's a lot of aspects in our, in our society that are being used to, to liquidate you. That is limit your ability to acquire wealth and you can acquire wealth from nothing. It's a little more difficult that way, but if you, if you're starting with $25,000, that's much easier. Okay. You can actually build quite a bit of wealth with $25,000 over a period of years, several years. So anyways, I just want to start out with that. And then I want to talk too far into that. But along those lines, can I? Can we bring up something? You guys have any questions? Like, what about this, John, and this sort of thing? Well, yeah, I was just wondering. So if, uh, if this is the situation, then how do you protect your assets? Well, OK. Um, one, the one general idea is that you want to keep assets, meaning property that makes you money. Your house is not your asset, okay? It's somebody else's. Uh, and your car is not your asset. It's probably somebody else's. Um, you want to keep it out of your estate. So separate your important assets from your estate. So your estate should really have nothing you care about in it. That way it doesn't matter what the what the probate rules are or anything like that or you know it doesn't matter what legal rights you have or protections you have under the statute because if you have nothing it doesn't matter if you have nothing in your name like me okay i look like i'm homeless if you look at my balance sheet i'm homeless mm -hmm. so that's what you want to be is you want to you want to be able to benefit from the use of property and keep it out of your state so generally so there are vehicles and things you can use entities you can use companies you can use contracts there's equity stripping, there's liens you can use, there's things of that nature that you can use to remove and maintain property, property rights out of your state while you still have control over them and you're still receiving benefits from them. That's the key thing. Mm -hmm. And by the way, so someone mentioned here, what is this, D or O? Oh, Batman. Retail, right? I don't know about the Cisco lawsuit. You got to tell me about that one, but retail. So check this out. We know that the big box retail stores like Walmart, they're turning into your phone apps, okay? That's why everyone wants you to download the phone app. I hate this. I hate when people tell me to do that because I know what they're doing. They're, re they're removing the brick and mortar locations from, you can't just walk into a store in the near future. You almost can't do that now. If there's some items that uh, used to be stocked that are not anymore, you have to order them on the internet. <clears throat> I noticed that at Walmart and some of the, um, hardware like Lowe's and things like that. Mm -hmm. So here's the nice thing about that though. Where before, if you want to sell what Home Depot is selling, you have to get a franchise. Now you can sell it. You can sell it online. That's the way the economy is going. There's no reason why all of you shouldn't be in the next few years making all kinds of money that you, you can't even count. You don't even care. You should be making all kinds of money by selling things that are all people are already buying. Why? Because the people that are selling it, these big brand names, they're making it easy for you to sell because it makes them more money. Instead of complaining about what's going on, 
they're handing you the ability to do what they're doing without all the costs. They're taking on all the liability. All you have to do is just go sell the thing they're selling. I'll tell you, my wife, she was selling uh, strollers a few years ago. She was selling strollers by drop shipping them, never taking them in inventory and netting $100 each time. So she basically, here's what she did. For about three and a half minutes of her time on the keyboard, she was making $100 for every few minutes she spent on the keyboard, finding an item and putting it in her shopping cart. Everybody should be doing that. Why? Because everybody's buying stuff. Why shouldn't you be selling the thing that people are buying that you're also buying? Why wouldn't you want to do that? It's a gold mine, right? So to answer your question, Moko, it's one thing to have a vehicle or entity or something you're using to take things out of your state. Okay, that's great. And so now what do you do? So I've succeeded at doing that and I've succeeded at understanding where I'm being liquidated. I'm going to avoid that. And now mm -hmm. what? I've got a little bit of cash here. Now what? Well, right. set up a way to sell and you don't need a lot of cash to do this. You don't need a lot of cash. Sell stuff that people are buying. Like I was giving an example a few weeks ago. Uh, I noticed in the mail room, <laughs> some, some kids here uh, in my office complex, they bought a whole case of uh, paper towels in the mail. Mm -hmm. This is crazy, but okay, fine. You guys, you guys want to buy paper towels that way. I'll sell them to you. The markup's like 20 to 30% if you didn't know. You're not going to net that, but I'm just saying the markup's 20 to 30 percent very easily. Yeah, drones are coming soon. Okay, that's going to be distribution, but guess what? You still can sell the product. It doesn't matter how it's being delivered. All right. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to add to that? Give me more examples of where you think we're being liquidated. Where where are we being inhibited from enjoying the benefits of our labor or accumulating wealth? Where is that happening? What about oh, information? Information, right? You're not getting good information. You can't even yeah. talk to people. The only way to get good information is to talk to people that already figured it out. <laughs> you know? You yeah, just, so you everyone's to arguing because they all think they have different information. Well, there's the, you, you want that, but that's how different people acquire wealth. They Everybody's done it differently, but they follow the same basic principles, okay? Acquire assets with other people's money. <laughs> That's how you do it. And there's a, mi a million ways of doing that, but you have to talk to people. So one of the things I suggest people do is just for practice, connect in with the members of the Georgia Real Estate Investors Association. I'm not saying you have to buy real estate. I'm just saying connect in with these people because they're entrepreneurs and they're using tools. Let me give you an example. So I had a... Um, a real estate agent, I paid her some money to go find me some property. So that way I just, I, I don't, that's not how you normally do it. I just gave her some money so that that way she could justify her time. So I could have more of her, of her time. So she did that and she did a great job. And then I had my partner come out and he, he rode with me on, on some property and she's standing there with, she'd already given me some information on this property. Right? So my, my partner, he pulls out his phone, points it at the house and takes a, a photo. Next thing I know, He's got every piece of information on that house that you can possibly get. She didn't even have a clue. She didn't know about the debt service. She didn't know about lien claims. She didn't know about the history of the sales. Now you can go find that, but it takes for a while to find it. This software application my partner had for like, it's like a hundred bucks a month, All right? It gave him that information right now. So what's the benefit of that? The benefit is with her, even though she's going to try to do a good job, it's going to take her a week to get the, enough information for me to go knock on the door and see if I can buy the house. With my partner, one photo, one photo and 30 seconds later, I could be knocking on the door and making a, a real good offer or having an intelligent conversation with the person, you see? So I'm just saying, mm -hmm. those type of people you want to connect with. Don't just keep stay around with your same people that, you know, you st stay around the water cooler, so to speak, you know, talk about the same thing, same stupid stuff every day. Go talk to people that you never heard of before. They're doing crazy things you never thought of before. Yeah, Home Snap. I think it's under a different name now. But anyways, um, so look and identify. See what's happening when you're you're being liquidated. See where there's uh, where you, there could be a consolidation of wealth. Let's say in a family. Watch how that's being destroyed. Divorce destroys it. Family court destroys that. Taxation destroys it. But it's not so much the tax. It's when like, for example, your accountant 
doesn't file your tax return or does, or makes a mistake for which he's not liable. And then you're liable for all the penalties and they just keep on building up and then you get afraid and then you get up into a payment plan and then you end up, it just snowballs, right? That's what it's for. That's why you have all these penalties with the IRS. They want to liquidate you. They, the financial interests. Why is it that corporations, which by the way, the corporate income, the corporate dividends, that's taxable. Your wages really are not. But we're not going to get too far into that. But let me just say, why ask you this question? Why is it that the wage earner is being taxed first and the corporation is being taxed after it, it pays all its expenses? It's being taxed on what's left over, the profit. Why does it get to be taxed on after it spends all the money? What, can you imagine if you could take your paycheck, pay all your bills, and then pay a tax on what the money that's left over? Wouldn't that be nice? Most of you would probably pay no tax, right? Or figure well, out how to pay no tax. That's the way yeah. it's supposed to be, actually, but they're not applying it that way. It should be that way. Why are corporations treated differently? No one's made that argument, you know? So, again, that whole system is for, for liquidating people. So, okay, that's still going to be there. For wage earners, don't be a wage earner only. <clears throat> There's no reason why you, you shouldn't be selling strollers or selling retail goods. No reason. I, I was uh, the other day I was looking for a lawn service and it's kind of annoying, but it is a clever idea and it's been around for a while. It's like Angie's list, right? But I'm looking for a lawn service and in the search engines, I, 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 it's hard for me to find an actual lawn service. What you're finding is these services that list lawn services. <laughs> so you have to go to the service and then subscribe to the service, give your payment information, and then that service will go find a lawn service for what you need. So it's kind of wonky. I mean, but that's what's going on right now. Hmm. So I'm I'm just saying, look, see how this this is playing out. You can be doing something like that. John, I have a question. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, so you mentioned land grabs as a liquidation um uh strategy too. Uh I'm just gonna lose my train of thought. Um would you use the easement strategy to um, to go to um, counter any land grab? Uh, I can. Uh, that that is effective. Uh, I like to look at the individual situation because sometimes you can do other things. Sometimes you can argue something on the merits. I like to start there, but also you can you can uh, get control of the use of the land through an easement. That is one way. That way, it doesn't matter what happens to the title. Or it gives you some more power that way. You can also put a lien on the title using an HOA covenant. And if there's one in place, there's ways to use that situation. But you can control the title through an HOA covenant, which gives you the last say in what happens to that title. And you can control the use of the property through an easement or several easements. That's correct. I'm just thinking of, you know, the disaster zones, like, uh, and maybe the speculation that the government is going after some of these areas, especially I've heard North Carolina um, for maybe the minerals under the ground. And I just heard that there's a huge fire and I live in Colorado um, in Eastern Wyoming on private land where they recently discovered rare earth minerals um, in the last year or so under the ground and um, that they were, you know, burning it down and the fires acting not like a usual fire. And I lived through one of those fires in our area. Yeah. Well, this um, is just uh, so what they're doing is they're trying to avoid the use of eminent domain because eminent domain has, you know, a very difficult criteria to satisfy. So in, instead, they'll use, like I was saying before, the fine, the fine scheme on uh, titles and other like taxation and these sorts of things, or take advantage of or maybe even create a natural disaster type situation and, and then somehow justify eradicating everybody from that land, you know, which is what was done to the Indians. It's nothing new. I mean, people came here, we did that to the Indians. So it's being done to us by the same organization, really. But yeah, you have tools. Okay. And what really helps is if you were to work with people in that, in that neighborhood that work together, because your HOAs really should be stepping up or being used as a tool to establish a governing body in your counties that's separate from your county. The HOA has more power than the county board of supervisors. No one's using it. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, someone's asking me about privacy yeah. class action. I don't like class mm-hmm. actions, by the way. Um, if you have an issue of privacy, make it make a claim yourself. Um, I like using, um, you know, security agreements where I can, and then arbitration claims. So I hope that answers. But I don't like class actions too much. But yeah, uh, there are many tools for that. But working with people is a great idea. Um, claims on the title, HOA is really effective for that. And then claims on the use of property, easements are really effective for that. Also, I like to argue things on the merits. Now, arguing things on the merits might involve something like this. Let's say there's something going on where the, the county says, we need this property because of such and such. If you know that it's a conspiracy of some kind to take you know natural resources instead of what they're saying uh, for you know public welfare or safety or something like that, you can file a report, collect your evidence, and file a report with the Office of Fraud, Abuse, and Waste. Now, you may not be able to find it that easily, but it's the Office of Abuse, Waste, and Fraud or something like that. And it's under your attorney general's office. There'll be a division. Now, it could also be you know, under your attorney general's office is all your executive functions. So, you, so really, the Office of Abuse, Waste, and Fraud is going to be under more like the inspector general's office. So you have an inspector general for the entire state. You've got one for the county, and you've got one for each of your cities. The inspector general's office may also be under the, the Department of the Treasury for your particular cost center, like your county or your city, okay? So if you can't really find it by that title, you don't know the person, it's going to be the accounting function under the Department of Treasury or the Office of the Treasurer for your municipality or for your county or for your state. So it's in that line of, of government offices, right? From Down from your AG is your first office, then your Inspector General's office for the state, county, city, and township, okay? And it could also be under the Department of Treasury for those uh, jurisdictions. So what you're going to do is accuse that office of misusing public funds for abuse or abusing the use of public funds for some form of abuse, and you have to be specific and describe it, or it's wasting the funds or it's using them in a fraudulent way. So you have to be able to articulate what it is that, you know, in those those three or all those categories, you have to be able to express what it is that county is doing in that way. And then what you do is you frame that complaint. You give it all the facts, you document everything, and you give it to the IG's office or the Office of Abuse, Waste, and Fraud. And you always want to include the chain of command in your correspondence and let everybody know that that chain of command is going to get all your complaint and all your documents. That way, if you send it to one office and it only has that one office address on there, the person who gets it might just chuck it in the trash because he's thinking no one else is going to see this and it's going to go away. But if he sees that you copied everybody, then he's going to have to do something about it, right? So what this does is it stages a situation where you don't sue the government for the merits of what they're doing. You sue another office or an agency in the government under the executive branch for failing to investigate the misuse, fraud, and abuse of public funds. So now now you're using a resource you already paid for. You're using the money you already spent to solve the problem instead of spending money and time to reinvent a claim when you already have paid for the government office to investigate this claim, you see? So that's dealing with something on the merits. But like you were asking me, maybe in addition to that, we need a little bit more leverage, right? So if I can work with a few people in the area, maybe I can get an HOA covenant or I can modify one or I can make a master HOA or I can uh, input, uh, I can establish some easements, right? You know, the biggest, the biggest land grab going on across the board, the whole country is the property tax right now. And it's exploded in Texas, expanding across the country. Yeah, raising the millage rates, and what they're doing is they're taxing the inflation. It, it, it is coming through, and the school boards are writing bonds and doing reverse amortization, rolling the bonds forward and issuing more. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and they're not doing it, and so these millage rates are going up. The property values went up from the QE, you know, like the 7T, the 1.2T, all that COVID, two trillion. And so now these people are all paying higher property tax, but your average income is staying level. And uh, it's an equity stripping. And it's slowly uh, 37% of the houses in Houston, around the Houston and the counties are about to go into foreclosure because the property tax went up 150%. Right. And, and so it's, it's all by design, but the, 
The culprit is these uh, school boards, and that's a big dog. It's two thirds of all property tax, and they are bankrupt. Oh and they, yeah, okay. And, and they look at the taxpayers as the piggy bank. Yeah. And so what they're doing is they're breaking the rules. They're going to the appraiser and the assessors in the counties, and they say we need three hundred dam, make it work. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to work. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and so that's the equity stripping that's right on everybody's doorsteps. Higher in some states, higher in some areas, and others, depending on which state you're in. But uh, it's just going to increase. And uh, so the asset protection, like you're talking about, everybody should be implementing easements, HOAs, security agreements on everything because they're coming eventually. To they should. And, yeah. and, and also you start working with your community. The other thing you can do is you, got, you guys can write legislation. Imagine, imagine writing a piece of legislation that says over the next 10 years, we're going to slowly change the budgeting to eliminate the property tax loop in collecting tax for funding our government. We're all for the tax, but you cannot loop in our property titles in the payment of the tax. If you want the tax, jack up the sales uh, tax. Don't take it from our property. See, they can get the tax anyway, guys, but what they've been doing is looping in your property titles. That's why they have titles in the first place, so it could be taken from you. Correct. Yeah, they're doing it that way on purpose to, uh, like the World Economic Forum, you own nothing to be happy. They're doing it on purpose where they can get the title. Yeah, so make it to where you have new legislation that says from now on, you're going to reduce property tax collection, and you're going to offset that by collecting more sales tax. Make them do or some some version of that, right? Or taxing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, spirits and alcohol and stuff like that, right? Or tobacco products, which they completely can do. That way, they get out of the letting them fund the government by a property tax, which simply loops in your your property that you need for your sustenance. It loops it into funding the government when it, they don't have to do it that way. They just They're do it that way you. so they can liquidate you. Yeah, you know, they're going to have to, John, because there's this uh, yeah. developers in Texas. There's about six or eight lawsuits, and uh, they, they, they brought it all to light, and the, they had these big meetings, and the school boards are coming and saying, hey, we're, if you don't give us the money, we're bankrupt. They tell them, you're bankrupt now. They said, what do you expect us to do? Well, here's you what you need to do. You take the minutes in that meeting, and you get a few people in the and you file a receivership against them in court because they've already admitted they're, they're, they're insolvent. So now you file the receivership, and you file a report for inspection and have them audited. For misusing public funds. Yeah, I think that's a doing. What have you done with my damn money? Right? That's put true. them in receivership and liquidate the schools and sell them to investors to put them in the office space or something that benefits the community and take them private and then take away the money. That's what you need to do. Put them in receivership. We can do have that to. too. Yeah. yeah. Have to, have to, because you can't, you can't, I mean, so what they did is they're screaming, you don't love the children. <laughs> like, look, <laughs> yeah, that works. Socialism. But yeah, it, yeah, yeah. it's like we love the children, but you cannot liquidate, do an equity strip on every property in these counties until nobody owns property. Well, owns BlackRock property. is going to come in there because who do you think is going to come in and still use the property? A renter. And who's the renter going to be? Somebody who has three times the income that most everyone else does, right? Mm -hmm. So that they're going to destroy the middle class. That's the whole plan anyways. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> But that's, you're going to have to put them in receivership, just like you're saying. They're insolvent, and uh, it's got to stop, and uh, you know it's worse in some places than others. But every, if you look on your county, anybody on this call, you look on your property tax, two-thirds is a school board. It's a black hole. And well, here's what you more. do. Look, if you have three people that are property taxpayers, and two-thirds of the budget is for the schools, you, file a, you get those three people to file a petition for involuntary receivership of the school. Watch how fast the, the roaches run all over the place. Trying to run for cover. Involuntary receivership of your school board because you got creditors now that aren't getting what they paid for. And liquidate them. Put the school property up for auction. You paid for it. Put the damn thing up for auction. See what they do then. See how see how fast. How are they going to fix that? Yeah, that's what they have liquidate to do. Because yeah. Yeah, they were they were screaming out, well, what are we going to do? What you know, what's going to happen to all the teachers? And then in some areas, you know what they were going to do? They said they're going to lay the teachers off and keep the administrative staff. This is the <laughs> please do that. Please do that. We need to get rid of this crap, anyways. I mean, look, in the fifties, fifties, uh, women were tricked into uh, getting other jobs to double the household income, right? Not double it, but so what happened is 
they, uh, the culture changed so that the household income would increase. So what happens when both parents are working? The children get raised by the state, right? Which is <laughs> the problem. But the family at the same time then becomes uh, needing that money because of what? We went from Diners Club in the 50s to all these credit cards now. So now the parents need the two income. They need four incomes now uh, to pay the credit card, the debt. They got everybody using credit now. When, when really credit should only be extended to businesses, but they got consumers doing it. So this is, this is what it is. It's liquidation. We need, hey, we need to get rid of the schools. Yeah. What you shared on the petition for involuntary receivership. Now, this petition, which is really a complaint. I mean, you're talking about a petition in court, right? Yeah, you file a petition. And here's what you do. You make an allegation and we can get it. We can talk about this. I can show you guys how to do it. So you file a petition. You make certain allegations, some of which include you identify the debtor in possession. You identify the creditors. Who are the creditors? The taxpayers. Mm -hmm. They didn't get what they paid for, right? The debtor in possession is going to be the school board or the county, or however you want to, you know, or all of them, right? And then you go into the, what is your interest? Well, our interest is that we pay property taxes and the payment of those taxes is, is secured by the county's lien on our property that if we don't pay, you can foreclose on our property. So that's the, that's the interest, the collateral. So we're paying and we're not getting, but yet you can still take our property. So that makes them the debtor in possession. So then what you want to do is you, you file a petition, you get in a receiver appointed. Once you get a receiver appointed, which might be a group of people, the receiver then uh, starts scheduling auctions of the sale of the property. So we start with the schoolhouse. Let's sell the school. Imagine that. Yeah, and that's all they got. I mean, that's their only collateral. Sell, is the, sell school the school, house. sell the furniture. Seriously, see see what they do. They they will be dumbfounded. We fucking have the power to do that. <laughs> That's what's going to take. Yeah, this is good information. Mm -hmm. It would take one of y'all to do that. One, and then watch how fast they all step in line after that. Start went start crying, begging for mercy. You yeah, want to liquidate we, us? We'll liquidate you. It, it came on real strong around, what, 2001 or two? Remember when they started building all these Taj Mahal elementary and, and uh, high schools? I mean, all of them exp exploded. I, I looked at the charts in Georgia. It went from 1,000 per student to about 12,000 spent per student. But oh, yet, they, yeah, they're taking in millions. Of course, now the students are dumber. So you're smarter when they only spent 1,000. <laughs> right, right, right. They're programmed at 12,000, but it goes into the... Uh, uh, the uh, general account. It goes into the general account, and there's no accounting to show what the hell's going on. And this is across every. And this is fraud. Country. This is the definition of fraud. Can you imagine going to a, 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 a your stockholders meeting without a, 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 a statement? Yeah. Without a financial statement, <laughs> you wouldn't leave there without unless in handcuffs. <laughs> right. Right. You would. You, you go Why to jail. Are we putting up with this. So look, you you already talked about this before. You guys can go in and and. and investigate the budgeting approval process for whatever agency you want. I told you department of health and department of education, go, go get them, go get them. There's a budget approval process. You guys have all the control here. You can get the court to intervene in your audit of the budget for the school, for the department of health. You can own these creatures. You should, we shouldn't be complaining. We have all the facility to do stuff. The only thing I would say, though, and to add to that, is I would I would put an easement on my land before I did it, so you could be well, sure you could, yeah they're retaliate yeah, right could screw you over yeah. yeah HOA easement exactly Taylor what do you think Hi John um, if one was to let the creditors sue them and in this case um, the the creditors being credit card companies should that person be in a financial position that they don't need access to credit from that point on? Because I don't know how their credit card applications would be approved if. Okay. That's um, a good question. So the, the concern is that people have in not paying creditors. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, if you're going to struggle to pay because you mm -hmm. want to keep your credit good, you're just going to waste your money because in the end, you're not going to be able to pay. If that's where you are right now, so you may as well just keep your money now, right? Don't pay. Don't make decisions on that based upon the consequences of not having access to credit. But to answer your question, you would not have easy access to credit. But I can tell you this, uh, and I can tell you from 
looking at other people and doing these things over the years, my credit score is way worse than most of y'all's. It's like, well, now it's not, but back in the, in the, in the last 30 years, it was like 520. I remember one time I went into a car dealership and the dealer came out and laughed. He laughed at me and he said, did you just arrive on earth? I gave him my credit file and I knew he was going to say something like that. And I just started laughing. I said, no. And I just said to him calmly, I just said, okay, okay. How much more down payment do you want? <laughs> so I just mm -hmm. gave him more of a down payment, which goes to my other part of my answer to your question is there are other measures you can take other methods that you may not be aware of, but just because you don't know, it doesn't mean you can't do it. If you don't just can't just walk in and sign a credit application and get approved like your neighbor, there are other ways to get credit and use credit and to make money. So you're not excluded from the credit game. You just have to get better at it. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It's just, I think what you're saying is it's a different mindset. If you're going to do this the way you're suggesting, I think you have to be mentally prepared to do things a different way, to do more research, to be more educated and not just do things yeah. the way, the status quo of the way of doing things. Is that yeah, sometimes you can just kind of, sometimes you can push your way through. Sometimes you can't. It's like, so, so, for example, sometimes you have to take a few months of planning. You have bad credit, right? So maybe it takes you pulling your file and then removing some items. And there's a couple of tricks to doing that. Uh, but I don't start there. I start with teaching mm. people how to actually use credit. So for example, um, I was renting a, a, a house a long, long time ago, back in like 2000. And it was in Florida and the owner was uh, some attorney in New Jersey. And the woman asked me for my credit information and a thousand dollar down payment. It was like, I forget how much it was, but anyways, um, I, I had the money, but I didn't have the credit and I know they were going to run my credit. So I told her, I said, I can give you my credit information. I said, but I, I don't have good credit. So if you're basing your decision on my credit, I'm going to ask you, please accept m my statement that I'll make, I'll make sure the rent's paid. Just like that. And she goes, well, I don't know. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to ask the owner. I said, that'd be very nice. And she did. She asked the owner, he goes, yeah, sure. You know, and he just made a decision outside of my credit. Now that doesn't always happen that way. You're not going to be able to do that with an apartment complex. Okay. Right. But this was yeah. an individual owner. So every situation is a little bit different. I had a client mm -hmm. that was trying to get a car and he was, he kept calling me asking, what if, what if, what if? And I said, did you go to the lot and rent and buy the car yet? He said, no. I said, go do that. Go to the lot and buy the car. And, and I told him a couple of like tricks to use for the credit thing. And he calls me up on the phone that day and he goes, man, that was awesome. I got this smoking deal. It was really good interest rate. It was really low interest rate with horrible credit. <laughs> wow. you know, it's just because sometimes, you know, there's certain situations you can be in, but th here's the big thing that I want people to learn. If you have bad credit, what you want to learn is creating cash flow to then offset your, your living expenses where you're working for the money. So stop focusing on personal consumer credit, but focus more on building up your cash flow because that's the first step in building a net worth. Most people that are concerned mm -hmm. about their credit don't have a net worth. So start with some cash flow and then start building up your net worth. And then within the next few years, you'll see how to fix your credit or to make it look better. And then mm -hmm. you, can, you can start going. It does take a few years to get some momentum though. And then also, do they, would the credit card companies have access to your personal, like if you have cash, like you were saying in the example before with the guy, he had the cash to pay his cards, but you told him not to pay it. Do, do they have access to your cash in your bank account if it's in your name? Yeah. Okay. If there's a discovery process going on in court, uh, that information can mm -hmm. be discovered and you would know okay. months in advance, but yes, that can be discovered, but they don't automatically have it. Okay, so that guy's cat, whatever money he had, it probably wasn't in his personal bank account. It was somewhere else. Yeah, we put they into couldn't... an LLC account. Yeah, we okay, made okay. Yeah, we made okay. him. I made him uncollectible. Okay, okay, okay. That That's makes what we sense. Did first, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I'm not in the position myself right now. I'm just like thinking ahead, um, and I'm just trying to like get my mindset prepped for like thinking a different way because I look, have look. always done things exactly by the book. <laughs> Well, this and... is the book. I'm telling you how to do it. You just haven't read, read the whole book. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a better I mean, book. <laughs> look at it this way. Can you get can you get a merchant account? I mean, look at it. Can you get a PayPal account without good credit? Probably. Mm -hmm. You can get a PayPal merchant account without good credit. Can you get a website yeah. without good credit? Yep. Of course. Can yeah. I buy an Etsy store without good credit? 
Yep, I might need some money. Okay, so if I don't have any, I'll call my Uncle Bob. Whatever. Maybe I can get the seller of a website to finance it for me, right? And I'll buy an mm -hmm. Etsy, Etsy store for $8,000. And maybe mm -hmm. it makes $1,500 a month when I buy it. And maybe it's going to take me an hour a day to work on it. Well, I got myself some cash flow, don't I? Is, yeah. that, better, is that better than yeah. taking $8,000 and paying my credit card bill? If I take the $8,000 yeah. and I buy something that pays me $1,500 a month. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Focus on cash flow. And I totally agree with you. I think it's just a little bit nerve wracking when, and by the way, like my credit score is excellent. It's just, it's just a little bit nerve wracking to be like, okay, I can pay this, but I'm not going to pay it. And I'm going to focus on cash flow. It's just like taking that jump. You know what well, I mean? don't ruin your credit deliberately if you don't, if you don't have to, Okay. but don't, and, and that's why I tell people like my, my friend who was my neighbor uh, years back and now we're just friends and she comes over to visit once in a while. And we were talking one day and she, she shows me her phone. Cause her, her sister just sent her a message, right? She shows me her phone and her sister sent her a, an image of her credit report with a score of 800. And we both mm -hmm. just started laughing. Because mm -hmm. her sister is just like a robot. She doesn't think for herself, right? And we both mm -hmm. we both came to the conclusion right away. We said, I wonder how much that's costing her. Because <laughs> well, you're not going to be a person that has a net worth if you have a good credit score. And that's all you care about. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're mostly, most of those people don't have a good net worth. So yeah, um, focus on the cash flow. In I caution you on having good credit. Don't let that be part of your self-esteem. It's a tool. Yeah. Just well, it nice... was in the past, but I'm starting to think differently, yeah. but I'm kind of yeah. in the position. It's like, I don't want to liquidate investments that I have. Basically, I would have to liquidate inv investments to be able to cover. I and that's foolish. Of... That's when you say stop. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep. All right. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Good question, though. Mm -hmm. All right. You guys have some good. Uh... Yeah. All right. You got some good comments here. Uh, let's see how we can. Uh, what's the more important are you forced to pay for what healthcare? I don't know about healthcare. I mean, what's healthcare? That's taking care of yourself. I was just talking to somebody about today about this. Um, you know, healthcare. I look at so we're talking about um, we're talking about positive stress, like when it comes to health, right? So what's positive stress? Well, that's exercise. That's weightlifting, walking, hiking, biking, all this stuff, right? That's positive stress. You need those stressors. Why? Because it makes your body better. It makes it stronger. Well, what, what's a negative stress? Not exercising, eating too much, right? Watching TV too long. That's a negative stress. Well, what does that look like years down the road? It looks like a person who's on pharmaceuticals and uh, can't walk very well, has poor posture and is limping around right? That's the result of not taking care of your body. So the, the whole financial system is based on that right now, in America at least. Look around in your neighborhood. Look at all the, um, what do you call them? Uh, the, um, the, the clinics, the healthcare clinics. Mm -hmm. So many new ones. You wouldn't have seen this before. What the heck is corporate health? What do we need a corporation for, for our health? Your health care is what you do for your body. It's not some corporation and some insurance policy. That's not health. That's for people that aren't taking care of themselves. Yeah, so. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I've been able to, so for years, now I have good credit. I deliberately did that in the last uh, couple of years. But I deliberately uh, let my credit be what it was, nothing, uh, because many of my clients were already in that situation and I coached them through it. And so I felt like I will do I will do what I'm telling them they should do in their situation. I'll put myself in that situation. And I did. I made a lot of money. And yeah, it was difficult. Um, but I managed to get through it with the same techniques I give my clients. So uh, yeah, don't deliberately ruin your credit, but trade trade receiving cash, keep your cash when you're going to be out of your cash just to keep good credit. This is not a good thing. Use your cash to acquire something that makes money. Then talk about keeping your credit in good standing. You can always fix your credit. And by the way, there's a really easy trick to do it. It takes like 30 to 60 days. The whole thing's a gimmick. I don't want to get into that too much. I think I need to make an appointment with you if I 
Okay. <laughs> so all right. I, all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I love to talk about, you know, things that you can do to increase your income. One of the things I just, uh, my, uh, my partner and I decided to do, in fact, oh gosh, earlier this year, I think it was late last year, I used the AI to write a, a business plan on an e-bike dealership. And it just kind of appealed to both of us. And uh, about a month ago, he said, Hey, let's get into something together. Let's do a joint venture. This is how, this is how you make money. Okay. So, you know, people and they have a similar like mind and they call you one day and say, Hey, what do you think about, let's get into this deal. And that's what I told him. I said, okay, uh, I'll put up, you know, some money. You put up some money. He has resources. So he went and set up a corporation, a website, a bank account. He said every, everything, he did all that part. And we're now I, I'm setting up the dealership with a contract. That's my job. And so we're going to set up this e-bike dealership and we're going to sell e-bikes out of China and drop ship them. We're not even going to take inventory. Now, part of our marketing plan is to mar to joint venture with local uh, shops that are selling bicycles and e-bikes. That way we can have the benefits of having a local shop without actually committing to a local shop. We can be the supplier. This is what we're doing. I, I see this as a trend. And although I think electric cars are stupid, I think uh, using the technology for lightweight vehicles like bicycles is a really good idea. Not lawnmowers, <laughs> but bicycles. I think it's a pretty good idea. I like to make fun of the guy with the electric lawnmower, <laughs> you know, in my neighborhood. Anyways. Hey, John, I have a question that's not related. But yeah, yeah. The hurricane. I mean, how yeah. are you doing? What, what, what do you, what around you? What's the area like? I know you're right in the middle of the path. Yeah, thank you for asking that. That's what I, I escaped. I'm in Yellowstone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but what about your property? What about your property? It's Is fine. I checked on it. I, okay. I checked with people over there. They're, they're, it's all good. Um, I had some furniture delivered and it, it, I think it survived the hurricane. It was on the front porch in two big boxes. <laughs> so uh -oh. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't, you know, it just the timing didn't work out. But anyways, I think it'll be okay. But uh, as far as I can tell, everything is good. I mean, most of, okay, so I know the wind speed over my neighborhood was like 85 miles an hour. So that's pretty bad, but it's not going to kill too many people or break too many things. It's not going to push the tree down mostly. So I, we probably have landscaping to do. That's usually what happens. Um, there was some leaking in one part of the roof. We just we just had a roof in, uh, replaced on the house. So there's some leaking there, but I think that's coming from underneath the, where the uh, rain gets pushed up underneath the roof. You're right, under the soffit. I mean, the, yeah, the uh, soffits, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But as far as I can tell, I mean, my area is okay because by the time the wind speed gets over and the water gets over to my area, it's dissipated quite well through the land, but the harder hit areas of the coastlines. So, and I didn't realize how bad North Carolina was. I didn't realize that the, I, I didn't think the hurricane would last that long, but it really wiped out a bunch of neighborhoods over there. It looked pretty bad. It wiped it out real bad. And that's what somebody brought up earlier. So what the government's coming and doing is like the, on a, like you do with eminent domains, they're coming and condemning the areas. So that's their steps on taking it. They condemn it. Yeah. The, yeah. There's two the mines that they're, that they're, that they're doing that too. One is a, uh, uh, quartz mine and the other is something else I forget. Uh, and they're very high, pure quality quartz that is very hard to find. And uh, uh, Kamala Harris' husband owns, I think the mine is Album Albemire or something like that. And her husband uh, has a significant share in it. And um, she's the one who gets to determine whether that property gets confiscated or not. Okay. And, and wow. Course, there's there's uh, Black Rotten Vet. Black Rot. Yeah, Black Rot. Is yeah, exactly Black right. Rot. And yeah. um, Vanguard are are involved in this. I don't know quite the relationship between her I'm about, I'm about you're, you're breaking up. What was that? Okay. Oh, I'm about 45 minutes away from that whole area. My friends are coming. I got friends, you know, sending food trucks and, you know, everything they can. It's right there. But everybody's talking about it. And uh, FEMA's, yeah. uh, you know, telling people they have to register. They're told one guy was fixing the road with his own tractor, and he said, "No, that harms the environment when you with your tracks on there." Yeah, yeah they're confiscating things from people that are coming in with supplies. Right. Yeah. There, there's These something going so on. But evil. From what I understand, they backed off some. One guy told the, 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 the man went to get fam food for his family. The FEMA guy said, "Nope, you're not coming back in here." And he, the FEMA guy got his butt whooped pretty bad. Good. And, I'm so glad to hear that. that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
They try to do something over here, Ray, uh, called a lockdown in Orange County, Orlando. Mm -hmm. And I told my wife, I said, don't, 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 there is no, stop repeating it like it's valid. You know, she's like, they said it's a lockdown. I said, stop repeating it like it's valid. There's no such thing. (laughs) There's a public right of way. And unless there's an imminent safety risk, tell the officer to get out of the way, (laughs) you know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, FEMA has been weaponized. I mean, it was designed to protect the people when it was sold as, and now it's weaponized. Yeah. just like everything else is being turned off. The weather is weaponized. I mean, yeah. yeah, for sure. Somebody yeah. said that the never before has hurricane force winds moved 800 miles inland. And that was um, in uh, the Carolinas. That's Probably possible that and it may be manipulated as well somehow. Yeah, you know, keep, it, keep the hurricane in place. it definitely is being manipulated. Yeah, yeah. I saw geoengineeringwatch.com. That guy like tracks it and he shows it on maps and he showed yeah. all these uh, beams being sent out from, uh, you know, Harp, D- yeah. DOD and stuff. Yeah, that was making the, um, the, the hurricane stay in place. You can cause pressure in the atmosphere on a big scale. You can also cause a temperature change on a large scale. You can do that with chemicals and probably radiation, I imagine. So I don't know. I wouldn't put it past So in this situation, like what you were talking about before, like the people in in North Carolina. So can they file um, claims against uh, the fraud and and misuse? See, this is the problem. They don't know how to, even if they are aware of it, they don't know how to say it. They don't know how to describe it and they don't they can't articulate the law that was broken or the misuse of public funds. They don't know what to do. All they can do is go on YouTube and complain about it and then it becomes a conspiracy theory. Yeah. What do you do? I mean, how wh- that's what we like to do. We like to try to get in, in those groups of people and try to help them mm-hmm. express what the problem is and then do something about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They have to know how to yeah, because it's totally look right here. I mean, I've got it. I don't know how to post it on here, but. What? I pulled it up, and so this is it's hurricane and tornado control device, and it's patented. Wow, the, the patents are right here, and it's actually created for war, for sure. the military. Yes, yes, and uh, but what it says is uh, you know, it says hereby causing hurricanes or t- tornadoes to form. The incentive concept also incorporates utilization of uh, decimal sound waves to alter the direction of the low atmosphere systems barometric pressure thereby determining the path of the hurricane or tornado that's what we just saw that this well and that's already public saying, record yeah yeah but you're not saying that we have to prove that that's what they did you're just saying that we have to state a claim that yeah, we have to accuse them of using our money to do that we didn't tell them to do that it's the government we didn't tell we didn't pay taxes and tell the government to fix the climate because the climate change is a hoax, as you know. Mm-hmm. But even if it's not a hoax, we didn't tell them they can collect taxes to fix the environment. That's not what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to keep the roads in good shape and then shut up. Right, right. And this is, I mean, I don't even know if this is government. This is more a deep state doing this. Yeah, well, I'm sure. But I mean, the government's not doing anything, really. It's the foreign financial interest. Mm-hmm. But still, it's the use of our public funds, really. And really, part of the thing what you guys should be doing is in addition to you should you should be pulling the budgets for these counties and municipalities. And then wherever you see foreign money, where the money's coming from a non-resident, make them give it back and make, make it a law that they can't accept it. Yeah. That would be a big was, thing. That's why That'd I was be, late, John. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I went to the meeting. I've been go, I went to the planning and zoning meeting tonight. And yeah. I'm, I'm go, see, you can't do it. You have to go to the county commissioner meetings and the planning and zoning meetings to see them, to see what's going on before you can bow up. And and nobody okay. goes to them. Yeah. They and, they count on that. Yeah, they count on low low attendance. And and so the system is set up that silences acceptance is you acquiesce and that means you they agree. Do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you know that's what I'm saying. Make sure they that you don't allow your municipality or county or whatever to accept foreign foreign money. And make sure that if your state gets foreign money, that your county doesn't benefit from it. Yeah, that's it to pull the budget. That's what they're saying. That, and they'll that is so to... important. Yeah, yeah, that is so important. And you should also try to you know dial back some of their funding. I mean, most of the accounting is what's called zero based budgeting, which means. Uh, the the government you gets less money every year it uses less money so 
mm. it has an incentive to use more money that causes waste. So if you if you change zero based budgeting to something else like like a business would use like for profit, it would run more efficiently. See, there's all kinds of things we can do that are very, very simple things. A lot of people don't know they could actually change the rules of civil procedure that would actually decimate the banker's ability to use the courts to get liens against you. <laughs> oh, that would be a good topic for discussion. It's very easy to do. It would take you the effort of writing a term paper in college, okay? And you write it and put it up to the Supreme Court for revision of the rules. You can certainly do that. You mean Supreme He's, Court Supreme Court of the state? Yeah, yeah, your Supreme Court writes the rules of civil procedure for all of your trial courts every year. It revises them. And oh. the, mostly the lawyers do that, but you're not prevented from doing it. So you can revise the rules in such a subtle way they don't even know what's going on. I'll tell you right now, because of the banking system, the lawyers got smart and said, hey, let's uh, let's make it easier for us to sue for our clients. We'll just make it to where we don't have a burden of proof at all. So instead of suing for breach of contract, we could just sue for a stated account. The burden of proof is almost zero. They did it to us. We could do it back to them. <laughs> People don't realize how much power they have. Exactly. Yeah. Well, look, I will, um, I will, this is a good conversation. I'm going to just take it like it is. I'm not going to edit this. And when it renders, I'm going to put it on YouTube privately and I'll put a link to it on the channel. I might make it public. I'm not sure yet, but at least I'll put it privately. You're welcome to share with anybody. That's great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Great. Thank you, John. Great call. Always great. All right. Thanks so much. And thanks, Marissa, for uh, recording everything. Sure. Have a good night. Thanks, John. All right, y'all. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. Take care. Take care. Bye.